mayoral forum hosted by Cal TV in the Daily Californian. Tonight we are so excited to have three candidates running for Berkeley mayor here with us to discuss key issues campus and citywide. My name is Kimia Adibi from Cal TV and I'll be one of your moderators. My name is Bella Liu, I'm also from Cal TV, I'm another one of your moderators. Hi, I'm Crystal Olson, I'm from Daily Cal. I'm I, Ali Mata, and I'm also from Daily Cal. Uh, we hope that tonight offers you some introspection into your candidates on matters that matter to you. We will also have time at the end for a Q&A for you to ask your questions directly to the candidates. Now, let's get started. Hello, I'm Kate Harrison, and I am a Berkeley graduate. I actually held mayoral forums in this very room many years ago. Berkeley needs a mayor who's a leader, who knows how the system works, but is not beholden to it. Berkeley needs a mayor who knows how to make change. I am that mayor. On my seven years on council, I enshrined equity in every policy we passed. I protected workers and tenants. I made sure that we redesigned public safety and public health to benefit everyone in our city. And I reduced our GHG emissions, for example, by adopting 100% green energy and by creating the Climate Equity Front. Berkeley also needs a mayor how to find resources. I found $15 million in our existing budget for roads, parks, safe streets, and the climate. You need a mayor who's going to ask corporations to pay their fair share. That's why I wrote and passed the empty homes tax, the Uber and Lyft tax, and passed affordable housing fees. You need a mayor, finally, who demands transparency in the budget and council process. I will fight the hide the ball mentality that operates at the Berkeley City Council. Please be part of this journey. Thank you. Okay, is this working? All right. Good evening. I grew up in Berkeley, graduating from Berkeley High and UC Berkeley. After decades of service on boards and commissions, including Planned Parenthood and the Zoning Board, where I approved thousands of units of new housing, I was elected to the City Council in 2016 and re-elected in 2020, with more votes than any council member in the city's history. On the council, where I still serve, I've sponsored more than 600 items of legislation, including many that have been transformative. I wrote Berkeley's blueprint to end homelessness. Homelessness is down by 45%. I wrote Measures O&P, funding the largest surge in affordable housing in Berkeley since World War II. And for eight years, I engineered the return of the West Berkeley Shell Mount to the Ohlone people. This race is not about who's the most progressive candidate. It's about which progressive has a track record of delivering and the experience and staying power to serve as Berkeley's mayor. I'm tested and trusted, and I'm excited to be Berkeley's next mayor. Hi, everyone. Good evening. My name is Adina Ishii. I came here as a student at Berkeley City College. I got involved in politics first through the budget cuts to education. I helped to organize my peers against budget cuts um, up to the Sacramento and I was able to transfer to UC Berkeley's high school business. I was our League of Women Voters' first woman of color in 107 years. In 107 years, we had never elected a woman of color to president of this nonpartisan organization. And this is the background that I bring as a mayoral candidate. I know that we need a reset at City Hall. We have had two city council members resign. We've lost our city manager. And while this is happening, this prevents us from focusing on our problems. The cost of housing is out of control. Many people don't feel safe walking around in their own neighborhoods, and our streets and sidewalks are crumbling. I'm focused on housing and homelessness, public safety, and infrastructure, and I'm excited to be running and answer your questions this evening. Thank you for having me. Thank you for sharing. For the next 45 minutes, we will now ask prepared questions these candidates have no prior review of. Candidates, you will have 90 seconds to answer questions, after which the floor is open for anyone to follow up within one minute. Starting with you, Ms. Ishii. According to the annual Berkeley Police Report, violent crime rose 15% from 2022 to 2023, with sexual assault up 9% and robberies going up 32.2%. As mayor, what measures would you take to make Berkeley safer? Yeah, so public safety is one of my top priority issues. 
I know that it's important that we are looking at the root causes of crime. So we need to make sure we're investing in social services, mental health, and youth programming, as well as making sure that our police and fire departments have the appropriate tools necessary to keep us safe. I've been able to sit along with our dispatch, our police and fire dispatch, and I know that some of them are working far over 12 hours a day. How can they possibly be able to keep our city safe and to respond to calls when some of them are probably very tired from sitting in such long hours? I, I think it's important that we are looking at how we are looking at, uh, we're, that we're looking at crime because I think that so many of us um, see that these systems are inequitable. So we need to make sure that we're investing in current services and also that we are looking at how we can change our systems to make them more equitable. You have a minute. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Just to clarify, so that was a one minute warning that you were giving? That was, we were supposed to be 90 seconds. Yeah, it was only 90 seconds. Okay, so you'll tell us at one minute. You'll tell us at one minute? We'll tell us, we'll see a one minute 15. Yeah. One minute 15. Okay, thank you so much. So, keeping Berkeley safe is the number one job of the mayor and of our city. And it is something that I take very seriously. Um, and safety is a big issue at UC Berkeley um, for all students. But in particular, I will say that my experience is that women often feel more vulnerable. Um, and um, we need to address that. I actually came into UC Berkeley as a recent victim of a very heinous, violent crime. In the summer between my year graduating from high school and starting here at Cal, um, I was attacked, um, and I, I won't give you the details, but I just want to say that on a very personal and visual level, I understand this. Um, I'm already addressing it. I'm on the council. Um, in response to those numbers, I have an item that I already put forward at the city council, asking us, our city, to make plans to reduce four different kinds of harm in our city, strategic plans to reduce gun violence, sexual assault, vehicle violence, and retail theft. And the way that we're going to do that is by having a plan and carrying it out. Berkeley never has plans to reduce crime. We just talk about it like it's a, a big citywide thing and we're going to put a little layer of mayonnaise on the whole thing. And that's going to somehow take care of it. So um, we need strategic plans. We need to get serious. Um, kids at Berkeley High have been suffering for decades. Um, unheard around sexual assault, and it's time for us to get serious. Thank you. Hi, I actually think, sorry, I actually think we have been doing things about it. I introduced the bike patrol downtown and innovation that brought the police closer to the public in crowded areas of the city. I worked with your 4x6 committee that I was on to bring lighting to the campus area. Prior to that, students were not allowed to request street lighting, only homeowners could do so. We changed that. I helped fund the youth violence prevention programs that are now finally being um, pursued by the city after four long years of them waiting in abeyance. But really, frankly, to have a safe city, everyone must have trust and confidence in the police. People will not call the police if they do not trust them. That is why I wrote the Charter Amendment to change the way that our civilian oversight of the police works, why I wrote written policies on use of force, and why I wrote policies on racial disparities. We also need to recognize we don't want our police doing things that others could do better for less money so that they can, in fact, focus on crime. Thank you. And if any of you would like to respond, you have one minute. I'd like an opportunity just to speak a little bit more about mental health. So this is something that I think really is a huge cause of what we consider to be crime in our city. And so something I want to focus on is the specialized care unit. So many folks don't realize that the specialized care unit is a non-police response to mental health crises. And currently, this is something that's not operating 24-7. This is really important because if someone responds the next day to a mental health crisis, it's not going to be that effective. Mental health crises don't have specific hours of the day in which they happen. So it's really important that we make sure we have enough mental health support and that we make sure that these services are, are frequent enough and accessible for people who really need them. And I think I'd love to jump in on that too. So um, Kate and I were, were on the council at the same time when uh, this came forward and we both uh, did a lot to move it forward. And I know all of us are committed to having what was originally a pilot, it's only operating during daytime hours, become a 24-7 service. And I'm very proud of the work that 
not, yeah. Just, just very briefly, we, we, need to work out a system. We, we need to work out a system. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So for our next question, the university is the center of many high-powered economies in Berkeley, like biotech and software engineering. And the university has embarked on city-side projects like People's Park and Anchor House, even though many city, city and constituent, many city constituents are not in favor. Although city administration doesn't necessarily have oversight powers over the university, how would you, as mayor, collaborate with the university on projects and economic endeavors such as these, while also ensure, ensuring your constituency is being represented? So, thank you. So, the tension between the, the town and down, between the university and the community, is not something that was created by the city or by the city. It was created by the state legislature when they made the UC system essentially its own its own entity that doesn't even that doesn't even uh, answer to our state legislature, and it created a system where they don't they're hosted by our city, but they don't pay taxes. They don't uh, they don't pay to flush literally to flush the toilets down our sewers. We provide uh, fire service at no cost to the university, and so. But I think that it's important for us to understand that neither of us created this. And we need to work together, first of all, to go to the legislature and say, help us figure this out. It's not fair. It's not fair for the people of Berkeley to subsidize the university. It's great for everyone in the state to do that, but it's not fair to ask the people of Berkeley to do that. And by the same token, I think in Berkeley we need to recognize the incredible contribution, not just of the university, but of you the students to our community. And so, you know, my, my goal is to have a positive, um, collaborative working relationship where I still hold um, my responsibility, my fiduciary responsibility to the city of Berkeley, but approach problem solving in a can-do, cooperative manner, knowing that the tensions are not a higher of our making. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for this question. The first thing we need to do is demand the university build housing. Why do we still have a parking lot at Channing when we could have student housing? Why don't we have housing at the Oxford track? We need the university to speed up. Other campuses in cities with UCs are required to add housing as they add students. Our university is not doing that. In fact, we're building a new parking lot at Fulton and, and uh, Bancroft instead of building student housing. So number one is demanding that, asking them not to continually master lease apartment buildings in the city because that just takes tax revenue away from us. This is a zero sum game. We're not adding anything. We also have successfully asked them to participate in homeless services with the team that's on Telegraph, and I think that's a very important thing. Um, I think also in social policy, we need to ask them, as I did, to not use tear gas on protesters, which they threatened to do at People's Park, and to not uh, harass people that are on Telegraph. There are many things we need to be doing, but the number one thing is to demand that they build the housing for you. Thank you. I think that something we need to keep in mind is that we don't always need to demand something, especially if it's already a priority of the university. So I know the university is not interested in continuing to master these apartments. It costs them a lot of money. It's much simpler if they own the buildings themselves. And that actually one of the reasons why it takes so long to build housing here is because just generally it's very hard to build housing here. It takes a long time. And for 50 years, we basically built very little housing in our city. This is something I've been incredibly critical of. Um, I have been attending the 4 by 6 meetings, which is uh, the meetings that happen between students, the university, and also the city of Berkeley. And I've learned through that about the amazing work that's being done there between these three parties. And so I think it's so important that students get a chance to interact with the 4 by 6 meetings and learn about how they can get involved. And when you asked about constituents, how can we make sure that constituents are being heard? We need to create spaces for them to do that. I think it's important that the city leaders go out into the community and speak with people, and don't just wait for people to come to city council meetings, because not a lot of folks, there are many folks who aren't able to attend those meetings, and they oftentimes go very late. So I, I think it's really important we're creating those spaces to hear specifically from constituents. In, in point of fact, if I might, the university is not giving up their master leases, and they've indicated to me when I met the Ch Chancellor Chris that she did, had no intention of doing so. So they may say that, but until it's in writing, I don't believe it. I want them to build the housing now and stop renting these buildings. Yeah. Also, I think we really have to focus on the relationship with them and how we build our city. They've done a pretty good job in their buildings, yeah, but we I, could do more I, on that. I'm going to 
jump in here a little bit. Um, we have a lot more to work on than housing. Housing is incredibly important, but we have a lot of issues we need to work on. And demanding things, is not, it doesn't get you anywhere because we have no power over the university. The only way we're going to get things done is to collaborate. And that's why we've been successful addressing homelessness together, because those departments have a collaborative relationship. So, you know, saying what we want and demanding things is, it's a statement of values, but it doesn't get things done. It has been done on other cities that have UC campuses. It is not possible to be folded. Thank you. Um, something that's important to add is that, that we're moving on to the next question. It's one minute for the entire rebuttal for all yes. three. Yes. 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 The city council has supported sweeping unhoused encampments, even when housing could not be provided by the city. A common problem cited by many unhoused individuals is that the temporary housing does not meet ADA requirements and creates a hostile, isolating environment. How will you address improving tra transitional homes? Yeah. Um, I had sponsored what was known as the gracing facility, which was the ability of Arby's to park. 50 of them, and for people who live inside an open warehouse, in tents, but in community, and to cook together, build a community, get job training, get their IDs, just the basics. That's what we need to do. We need to focus on programs that have services, and we have done some of that in Berkeley. Um, I do not really accept the number of 45% reduction in homelessness. I think it's not shown on the streets, and that represents how many people we house, but not how long they stay. We want people to stay housed, not just become housed for a night because we rousted them out of their encampment. Um, finally, we need job programs, like I introduced the downtown street team, which allows homeless people to be trained. That many of them go on to other jobs. They love this program. It gives them a purpose in life. Let's recognize that these are human beings and treat them as whole people and provide facilities and services that do that. Thank you. So I'm the only one of the three of us who has opposed the recent policy to uh, in, oppose the recent policy to um, sweep encampments. And so I, I want to say that first and foremost. And I also want to share a little bit about why, because I think that's very important. When I've gone down and spoken with people who are living in encampments, they've told me stories about how they've lost so many of their personal belongings, medication that they need, and also personal documentation. And what happens is if you're on the housing list, and then all of a sudden your, your belongings get swept, it can be even more challenging for you to access housing. So it's so important that we're looking at how we can make sure that we're providing enough housing for folks in shelters. And I just want to comment, you said transitional housing, there's, there's actually a lot of different layers within here. And I think it's important that we take a step back and we look at how we're providing housing and serving our unhoused population so that we can see the gaps in the systems. Because right now, there are a lot of different agencies that are working on this issue, and many of them are not getting a chance to to take the time to speak together. And it's not their fault, it's just that oftentimes there isn't enough time because they're so busy doing all the work in the city. So we need to make sure that we're continuing to support measures like Measure P and Measure W so that we are having enough funding to support our unhoused population. Well, thank you very much. And certainly having authored Measure P and Measure W, I really hope people are gonna vote yes, that's the money that we use to rehouse people. So the city of Berkeley does not have a policy of sweeping encampments. We've never have, not since I've been on council, and I will never support that. I wrote our city's homeless policies in 2017, and our council approved them. They are humane, they are housing first. We do outreach for health, mental health, housing intake. We provide food in the field, we do garbage pickup for people for, for encampments. We do a lot to lift people. And that is the way that we have actually taken 45% of people off the street. And that is a real statistic. That is from the federal count. And it is a snapshot in time and it takes into account anyone who may have been housed or been in a shelter who then uh, went back onto the streets because that does happen. Humans are not widgets. Getting housed is a complicated process and not everybody who is rehoused or gets into a shelter is able to maintain the housing. It is a real number, 45% reduction in unsheltered homelessness based on our humane policies. We have rehoused more than 1,700 people 
since 2016, and that is our policy. I, I, I'd like to push back on that. Um, we definitely do have a policy that have, allows for sweeps in the city. In fact, we have an activist in the audience today who I know has personally gone to prevent sweeps from happening. And in a previous forum, you, know, you have said, Councilmember Han, that sweeps are not happening. And I've been on the street and spoken to folks who have experienced sweeps, so I know it definitely is happening. And so when we say that we as a city provide humane and a compassionate approach, that is just you know, there are people who do I, I don't accept you denigrating the programs that I'm are sorry, actually rehousing speaking. people. Excuse me. I'm, I'm still speaking. So, you know, we say that, that there's a humane and compassionate approach. And I would say even though there are some people who are doing great work in our city who are providing that humane and compassionate approach, that is not our general policy and that there are people who are experiencing a lot of loss in our city and additional trauma. Yeah, frankly, the uh, city had the authority to remove dangerous encampments before, and if they are indeed dangerous, I think we should do that, but house people. My problem with the policy as it's stated right now is it still includes fines, and I think fines are criminalizing. Thank you. South Berkeley has a vacant storefront rate of 20% and no business corridor. The area has been historically gentrified and holds the majority of Berkeley's black population. How would you support this historically underserved part of Berkeley? So I actually live in South Berkeley and I am involved with the Lauren Business Association, which is that exact neighborhood. And so I know that when we talk about vacant storefronts and businesses that are struggling, especially small businesses that are owned by people of color, I understand that struggle because I live there and because I work with my neighbors who are really desperately trying to keep their businesses alive. We've lost so many local businesses in that area, and there are many things that we can do to support them. I think one thing is providing them with an easier way to go through permitting and licensing. Um, it can be so hard even just to start a business in our city, and I know that the Office of Economic Development is doing great work to try to streamline that process, and I really want to encourage that. Another thing is encouraging um, events that happen. So last year in December, we had an event where people could take the sticker passport and go visit different local businesses. It was a great way for folks to get out into the community and visit businesses they hadn't visited before. And one story I want to highlight in particular is my friend Betty Gray, who owns Alice's Relaxing Bath on Alcatraz Avenue. She has really struggled for 30 years to keep her business open, and she has spoken very passionately about how that business kept her and her family off of welfare. And we need to make sure that we are serving that population because as an elder, she isn't as tech savvy and isn't able to access many of the resources that would normally be available on our city's website. So we need to be going out into the community and actually seeing what's going on instead of just looking at people who are able to come to us and have the privilege and ability to do that. I think, is it circling around or this? Okay, sorry about that. So I, I would never go into a, a black and brown community and start telling people what my ideas are. And that's why the way I have been working with people on South Berkeley is to actually listen and to support the initiatives that are coming organically from the community. There's a huge project called Equitable Black Berkeley that has that has started and has been um, continuing for many years now with a group of, of local people who want to restore the Adeline commercial corridor and who want to rebuild. Um, the, we've lost we've lost three quarters of our African American population in Berkeley, and they they have the vision to rebuild an equitable black Berkeley. So I've already sat with them in meetings with Barbara Lee and I'm working with them in support of their vision. That's how I work. Now, small business in general. I was a previously a small business owner myself. One of the first items of legislation I did when I joined the council was a small business support package that has driven a lot of changes that have been helpful to small business. I um, am the person who wrote the outdoor dining and commerce legislation during the pandemic that allowed our businesses to survive. And I recently um, have put forward a, an item of legislation that's called First Year Free that waives fees and um, uh, taxes for the first year for new businesses. Thank you. It is important to help businesses that are still here with programs such as mentioned and the legacy business program that I created, also giving business rewards for doing clean energy, et cetera. But really we have to ask the first question, what is the root cause of this? 
The root cause of this is development that comes in and kicks out small businesses and then does not build. They get planning permission, they sit there, you know the missing link had to leave because they were evicted by the, the property owner. There's not a new building there. Do you want to build housing? Yes, do it. But do not kick out our small businesses in the meantime. Therefore, I support a vacancy tax on commercial businesses like the one that I passed for residents. I support required relocation of businesses, and I want to require builders to have one to two years to get started on building and not leave vacant holes in the middle of our city. That's what we have today. Uh, I guess I, can we jump in? You have 40 seconds if you're, if you're, are you done? Oh, I still have 40 seconds. Yeah, thank you very much. In terms of EBB, I do agree with the right to return, but I also want to say something about the right to stay in the first place. You know that once somebody's moved somewhere else, they're probably not coming back. This is what happened with both BART stations, when people were kicked out through eminent domain. We need to make sure that whatever happens in this Adelaide Corridor plan does not repeat past racist behavior that led to people being evicted. So we need to work on keeping people here right now rather than futuristically say, well, it'd be great when they can come back, which they may never be able to do. Thank you. So can we jump to my Yeah, I also support the work of Equitable Black Berkeley, and I just want to push back a little bit on the development piece because what I have learned working with the Lauren Business Association and also Bayobob, the Bay Area Organization of Black Owned Businesses, which is owned by my, my friend Yvette Holtz, um, is that they want to be part of the development so that they can make sure as things are being built that they have a space there still. And so I just want to push back a bit and say that if we are having development as we are on the Ashby Park Station, we want to make sure we're including the community to be part of those conversations and lead those conversations. Yes, and of course, awesome. and that, that is what's going on with the Ashby Park planning. Um, I just want to say that Kate represented the downtown for six and a half years where most of these problems um, are the most evident. And I didn't see anything coming forward to deal with this problem of big buildings coming in, not building spaces that are the right size for locally owned businesses, um, no initiative around that. So I have some ideas to address that. That's, that's because you have no development happening in the district council. Thank you. All the development. A few weeks ago, we worked on the piece. We're sorry. A few weeks ago, a few weeks ago, the Berkeley Peace and Justice Commission voted on a symbolic resolution for a quote immediate and permanent ceasefire in Palestine. This council has passed resolutions calling for ceasefires in international conflicts before, as with Ukraine, for example. As mayor, would you give your vote to a ceasefire? If not, how do you believe Berkeley should approach its role in advocating for international? Great, right. thank you very much. Um, so I strongly support a ceasefire. I support much more than that. I support permanent and lasting peace, statehood for the Palestinians, security for Israel, and peace in this region, which is suffering. I abhor the carnage and the loss of life. Um, there are massive human rights violations every single day, and it has to stop. I want peace. That is all I wish for. I do not believe the city council should pass a resolution, and I want to be very clear why. When we, we are not in charge of foreign policy. When we do take a position on an issue, it has to be a position that I am sure represents the overwhelming majority in Berkeley. And that in taking that position, we are not going to be hurting people in the community that I represent. I have not seen that level of consensus in the community. I have seen a lot of pain and a lot of different opinions. I probably, I literally have probably 10,000 emails on this subject. And I do not think that it is my role to step into a conversation that is going to be hurtful to the people here in the community that I represent. And that is how I differentiate it from other positions that we have taken. Yeah, well, cities don't agree with, other cities don't agree with that. The city of Lafayette, the city of San Francisco, Oakland, San Jose, the Democratic Party, the state, and the Alameda County Democratic Party have all passed ceasefire resolutions. Yes, I would vote on a ceasefire resolution. Why is this different to me? It's because it is our money from the U.S. government that is supplying the weapons that is creating this carnage. That is the carnage that occurs today with the Likud government. This is nothing about whether the state of Israel should exist. 
This is about what is this strong man leader doing right now in our name? Who does he remind you of? Donald Trump. Why is he doing this? He doesn't want to be out of office because the second he is, he will be arrested, as the courts have made incredibly clear there. So we are abetting someone who is operating what I consider a very criminal enterprise with the continued attacks on people in Lebanon and other cities. In terms of harming our own city, I think people are harmed when they don't discuss serious issues. I think the harm comes when people are told, don't talk about it. We don't want to hear from you, which has happened many times in council chambers. I was told, because I stayed to listen to the protesters, that I should not do that because it endangered someone else. I completely reject that formulation. I don't think it endangers someone else to listen to people. And this does not mean we have to pass the exact language of the Peace and Justice Commission. But we need to pass something to heal the wounds in our community. Thank you very much. I support an immediate ceasefire. I think that the loss of life, of innocent life, is absolutely horrific. And if you turn on the news and you don't feel anything, I would be concerned at this point. I think that one of the things that is an issue here in the city is that many people are not feeling that they're even being heard on this issue. And so one of the things that I think is important is that we provide a forum, an opportunity for people to be heard. The people want to have this conversation. And it's important that we give that space. I was president of the League of Women Voters, as I mentioned earlier, and that is one of the things that we do, is we bring people together around difficult topics and help us bridge a path forward. And the other thing I want to mention is that people have said, well, hey, I don't want you to take too, many, uh, too much time on international issues. And to that I say, if we had done something a year ago, then we would have spent far less time than is currently being used in city council meetings. I would also like to add that behind the scenes as this is happening, other things are not being discussed fully. Because we have continuing unrest, we are not able to really discuss issues fully. We have a lot of things put on consent, just voted out. Let's get out of the room. It's scary. I, I'm sorry, I have to jump in. There is no we on the council. That anymore. was the way it was operating so, when I was uh, there. You may have experienced it that way. Um, we went behind, um, in accordance with the Brown Act, the press was there, in fact, daily Cal reporters were in the back room with us, so were uh, other members of the press. It is an entirely legal way, and by the way, we did not conduct serious business. Mm -hmm. we, did, uh, we did things like uh, passing consent calendars, and by the way, you were there, and you voted on them as well. So I really think that passing dispersions <coughs> on the city like this um, and suggesting the things that we did, by the way, it was litigated, and it was found to be perfectly in accordance with the Brown Act. That's fine. Just because something is legal, that's not right. Next question. Yeah. Okay. How would you make housing more affordable for students? <laughs> First of all, I think students should be allowed to apply for below market rate housing, something that's prevented in state law. We made a small effort towards out people with certain grants are allowed, but you are not allowed to apply for these discounted apartments. We need to fix that. Number two, we need to promote the co-op movement, which is an inexpensive form of housing. Number three, we need to grow connections with the community. My house used to house eight students, and now it houses two people. That is not a good use of housing resources. We need to reform Prop 13. Why is it that those of us that bought a long time ago are not paying our fair share, which frankly aren't, and that is preventing the university from having the money it needs to build the housing for you. We also need to recognize that not evicting people is the number one goal. The Berkeley Democratic Club, which supports Ms. Ishii, is against Measure BB, which is on the ballot, to strengthen rent control. I am in favor of making sure our rent control is strong, our demolition protections are strong. It's something I've worked on my entire career, including for the California legislature when I created housing for farm workers. We need to continue to protect the people that are here now and housed. The minute you tear down that affordable unit, it's going to be a more expensive unit. We can still build new housing, but let's protect the people we have now. Thank you. <laughs> so when I was a student at Berkeley City College, um, as I was transferring to UC Berkeley, I experienced housing insecurity. 
it's hard to talk about because my mom's in the audience today, but I'm someone who's experienced domestic violence, not from her, just to be clear. But, um, <laughs> you know, uh, and so, you know, when I was a student with the co-op system, I was able to fish there, which means that I was there illegally. Um, but the co-op system was the system that really helped me to, to get access to housing when I really needed it. Um, and then I bounced around from place to place until I was finally able to find my apartment in South Berkeley. So this is an issue that I care a lot about. I definitely think we should be continuing to support UC Berkeley and building more student housing. As I said, it's so important that they provide housing for their students. Um, and one of the things I want to say about barriers to affordable housing is just the price. It costs so much money to build affordable housing. So we absolutely need to find more funding to subsidize the building of affordable housing. And I just want to also make sure it's clear, I support Measure BB, even though there are organizations that support me that don't. That doesn't mean that I align with them fully. I do support Measure BB. And I also worked here in the Student Legal Services Office with your attorney that can represent you on any issues that you have with, uh, with landlord-tenant issues. And that is so important. I think that many students don't know about their rights. And so I highly encourage you to check out the Student Legal Services Office because the attorneys there can provide you with a lot of resources and support, especially to prevent you from evictions or fight any habitability issues. Thank you. Thank you. So, Affordable housing is the, is the biggest crisis that we face here in our community, and it drives other crises like homelessness and food insecurity, which a lot of students sadly also experience. Um, UC Berkeley has shamefully, shamefully neglected housing. I will tell you that when I started UC Berkeley in 1979, it had such a terrible housing crisis that students originating from, from zip codes nearby, which myself, because I grew up in Berkeley, we were not allowed to apply for the dorms or for the co-ops. That was challenged in court and struck down later, but this is every year students come to Berkeley and they think, how can it be this bad? It's been this bad for decades. They have advocated their responsibility. Measure BB, I was the fifth vote to put it on the ballot. And I wrote the ballot argument and signed the ballot argument against the other measure, the landlord measure, which is a terrible, terrible measure that needs to be voted down. We just upsettled the South Side, tripling the de development capacity so that larger buildings can be built. We're doing our part as a city. And I also am a huge supporter of the student co-ops. When I wrote Measure O, the largest bond in Berkeley's history for affordable housing, I made sure that the co-ops could access that money. Sadly, they didn't step forward to get it. But I hope when we do another bond, they will. Um, yes, uh, respectfully, Councilmember Hahn, it is not the same for this generation as it was for us. Let's just be frank. How much student debt did you have when you left college? I had zero. How did you get through? You lived in group housing. And I wasn't fortunate enough to grow up in a home in Berkeley. I grew up in an apartment in the peninsula. And I did face housing challenges. But it is not what is faced today by students. This situation is significantly worse than anything we ever had. I don't even want to tell you what our tuition was because you will kill us all right now on the stage. Oh, she's going to tell you. Okay, so another thing that we need to focus on, in addition to reforming Prop 13, is alternative forms of housing, not just co-ops, tiny homes. I passed the legislation that allowed us to build tiny homes with different housing standards. Also, manufactured housing, which I did for the farm workers in California, is going up right now on university in my district. We've got to lower this cost, and there are many ways to do that, working with the carpenters and other trades. Thank you. Um, we will now be moving on to candidate-specific questions, so starting with you, Ms. Chief. You say that your experience working for nonprofits and community outreach programs like the League of Women Voters of Berkeley and the Berkeley Unified School District Reparations Task Force but unlike your two opponents, you have not served on city council. What would you say to voters concerned about your lack of in-government experience? I love this question. Thank you for asking this question because uh, both of my opponents, well, I would say specifically one opponent has consistently talked about how untested I am, how I don't have experience, and quite frankly, I think that's pretty common to hear as the youngest person on the stage, as the woman of color on this stage, um, I don't have 30 years of experience in something because I am only in my mid-30s. It's not possible for me to have 30 years of experience in something. Um, and I just want to just talk about the League of Women Voters. It's not a community outreach organization. It's actually a nonpartisan political organization. So we do everything from registering people to vote 
advocating on different issues, and also holding forums like these. So I've gotten a chance to work with our city council and our mayor on a number of measures, including measures O and P, which I know that Councilmember Han likes to talk about how she wrote it, but I did the groundwork to actually make sure that it got passed. And I think it's important that we don't dismiss the work on the ground that people are doing, because I think that the work behind the scenes is oftentimes the work done by women and people of color. Follow up to them. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll just say that um, Mayor Aggie was elected at the age of 32, and he had a ton of relevant experience. So it's not an age issue. It's about where you spent your time. Um, I mean, I think he had already served the city for 14 years um, when he was elected. Um, so I just, I just want to say that um, running a city like Berkeley is is a complicated thing. And it's not an entry level job. No comment, thanks. Yeah, I think comments like that, entry level job, I think that that really proves my point that I was trying to make. So, um, yeah, I, I also want to comment on the fact that uh, Council Member Han uh, talks a lot about her experience writing legislation, and that's not the mayor's main responsibility. The mayor's main responsibility is to facilitate the city council meetings and be the face of Berkeley. And so I think we need to ask ourselves, what kind of experience do we want our leaders to have? <coughs> who do we want our, who do we want our leaders to have? Okay. Next question is for Sophie. As a longest serving city council member among the candidates, transparency and accessibility have remained concerns during your time on the council, as seen in your efforts to have regular meetings to 10 a.m., limiting public participation for those at work or in school. If elected mayor, how would you ensure greater transparency and access to city council members to the general public? Well, thank you, because I value transparency and accessibility. So throughout the time that I've served, I always have town halls, I have meetings, uh, meetups at uh, farmers markets or in cafes, so I really try to provide a lot of casual opportunities. Sometimes it's just come. Um, Come, come as you will. Other times I give like 15 or half hour slots that people can sign up for. So I go out of my way to be very accessible outside of the formal council setting and I will continue to do that as mayor. One when I wrote and got measures O and P passed, um, I went on a tour of the entire city. I went with Mayor Adegui and we talked to churches, we talked to neighborhood groups and community groups. We went out in the community to tell them about what we wanted to do to end homelessness and why we need this money for affordable housing. And that's why we got almost 80% yes votes on those measures. So there's a lot of different ways that I have and will continue to be transparent and accessible. On the council meetings themselves, while in some ways the pandemic actually created a lot more accessibility than we have. Because before the pandemic, we didn't have remote participation. So actually, we have opened up participation significantly by allowing this hybrid format. And we have the ability for people to be at home and participate from home. And um, you talk about town halls, but I notice you haven't had a town hall in your district about rezoning. And perhaps that's because it's been excluded. Whereas the council members in districts one, two, and four have decided to actually, talk to people. it's because they. Um, I was talking. Excuse me. Please interrupt. Me. Isn't this the uh, rebuttal part? So I get to talk. I'm not interrupting. I'm, I'm not going to I'm just sentence. telling you that um, it's been delayed. It's not going to be heard until February. And since our planning department doesn't have anything out yet, I'm going to hold off on having my forum until we actually okay. know what we're talking about. Um, in the meantime, as I've been running, I've held town halls in every park in Berkeley. And I want to say something about this issue of uh, access to the council. The agenda committee, on which Council Member Hahn is serving the entire time, has rejected the recommendations of our Open Government Commission to make the process fairer and just two weeks ago. True. They gave us 50 or 60 recommendations and we took about 80%. None of them substantive, thank 80%. you. 80% of them. That's fine. Yet here you are running for mayor. Has anything changed? And what would you say to voters who are concerned by your commitment? Yeah. 
Well, first of all, I was running for mayor before I did that. So I stepped down to step up for Berkeley. I'm devoting all my time to running for mayor. To the extent that I can tell people the truth about what's been going on in the council, that would not have been possible had I stayed there. We had a hostile work environment. We saw Councilmember Robinson resign from District 7 in tears at meetings and at parties. We've seen our city manager leave. We lost our head of public works. We lost our head of health and human services. We have a 45% vacancy rate in some divisions. And some of this is because we have not been open. We do not have a process by which people can discuss not just a ceasefire, but the recommendations from our fire commission about how to handle fire safety. The recommendations about the waterfront came to us in a 300-page report the night before. That is not a process. That's jamming things down our throat. And when I don't know what's happening, you don't know what's happening. So it is not that I lost votes. I lost votes before. I didn't care. What I care about is the fact there was no way to discuss anything, and it was simply unacceptable. At this point, I can see that we're going to have at least four new council members, perhaps five. We have a new city manager, and we'll have a new mayor. It's a new day. We can set a course that is much more transparent and accountable than what we have seen to date. Thank you. I, I just want to say, a captain does not jump ship when, when the ship is in trouble. You're the person who stays on till the last. And our city has been stressed. It has been stressed by the pandemic. It has the problems that many organizations and cities have, which is that there's been the great resignation. Many, many organizations, private and public, have experienced that. We had an older workforce. We had a lot of, of retirements. Well, Kate left the council. I was busy trying to get a new city manager and recruiting Paul Budenhagen, who came, who's, who everybody's very excited about, and I'm excited to be able to work with him. So you don't walk away from problems. If you want to be mayor of a complicated city in a political environment, you have to be able to stay when things are rough, not walk away. Tenacity in the face of obstruction is not a, a good policy. Thank you. I know in the Daily Cal article that Kate Harrison talked about needing a recap for City Hall, but I'll tell you that those are my words and those are the words that I've been using since the beginning of my campaign. And if we really want to reset at City Hall, we need someone who brings new perspective, someone who's fresh, who has not been on City Council before. And if we're talking about how the city government has become broken and toxic, which are the words that Kate Harrison and Roger Robinson used when they resigned, then it's important that we have a leader who knows how to build compromise and bring people together around common sense solutions. As I mentioned earlier, I'm focused on housing and homelessness, public safety and infrastructure. I am focused on the issues and making sure that our city is accountab accountable and transparent. So I hope to have your support and um, if you're interested in learning more, you can go to our website at adinaishi.com or speak with me afterwards. I'd love to get an opportunity to speak with you. I think it's so important that student voices are being heard and I really appreciate you giving us the time to speak to you all today. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. It's been a very lively evening. Progress takes more than good ideas. That's the easy part. It takes strategy, skill, and it takes tenacity. You're not always willing, winning, and you cannot fold when things get tough. And being mayor of a complex, high-profile city does require actual experience governing in a high-stakes environment. My dedication to Berkeley deep and relevant experience demonstrated effectiveness and ability to stay the course are widely recognized. I'm proud to be endorsed by Berkeley Firefighters, Planned Parenthood, SEIU, and the Jane Fallon Climate Pact, Mayor Adegin, Vice Mayor Wengraff, Council Members Bartlett, Taplin Humbert, and Trega, statewide electeds Tony Thurman, Leah Cohen, and Fiona Baugh. I have the largest grassroots campaign in our city's history, more than 1,200 people who have supported my campaign, I've been with Huntley for a lifetime, and you can count on me to keep leading with dedication and passion. I hope you're not going to talk about crowd size next. But I want to say, what we really need is somebody who knows what's wrong with the system and has worked in the system. It's important to have a fresh perspective. But I have that perspective because I've been inside and now I'm outside. We need to challenge the status quo here. I have 30 years of budget and finance experience 
in the state of California. I ran the $1 billion state court budget and supervised 60 employees. I've worked in 37 cities and counties. I know we can do better than what we're doing today. And I know we can do that through legislation, through coalition, through bringing together money that I've got from the federal government and our regional partners. And who else knows that? The people that have endorsed me. California Nurses Association, I am their number one choice. Sole endorsement of the United Auto Workers who represent your graduate students. National Union of Healthcare Workers, Unite Here. When I was winner of the 2021 Sierra Club Trailblazer Award. What you're not gonna see on my list are some of the electeds who refuse to make change. And I think I'm kind of proud of that. I also want to say I'm endorsed by the presidents of Latinos Amigos, the NAACP, and the Coalition on American Islamic Relations. Okay, thank you. Now we'll be opening the forum up to audience questions. So we are going to have a microphone running around the candidates. We are going to take your microphone away. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Rev. Hello, everyone. Um, I feel a lot of tension on this stage, and I feel like an important part of being an elected, an important part of working in the city, is being able to navigate different personalities, navigate different policy topics, and being able to bridge uh, the types of concerns and the types of issues that we're working through with colleagues that you have who might not always agree with you. Um, can you speak to how you plan on being a different type of candidate, a candidate with a fresh, not only a fresh perspective, but also um, a willingness uh, to work with your colleagues in a way that doesn't feel like bigger? Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, I think you should have an incredible amount of consensus on this council. I was a tie-breaking vote for accessory dwelling units in the hills. I brought forward legislation to eliminate natural gas in all of our buildings, which was unanimously voted on. And I did a lot in police reform, also receiving unanimous votes. I've worked very well with this group of people. I don't blame my fellow council members. I think what's at stake here is the system itself is not working well for any of us. So the frustrations that you hear are partly that we've been operating under a bad system where the city manager frankly did not follow direction well. And you're pleased we have a new city manager. I think it'll make a huge difference. Kate, to just follow up, you're the, you're the candidate who resigned from council when you felt like there was too much disruption and unwillingness to work with one another. So as mayor, if you were to experience that again, would you, would you resign as mayor? No, of course not. I never resigned for anything. I'm, I'm in my 60s and I never quit anything before then. One reason I quit is because, or stepped down, is because the mayor was not accepting the differences. There was a lot of push towards the middle. We're all going to agree on this. We're all going to go in lockstep. And I don't agree with him on everything. I have a lot of respect for him, but I think we got into a place of manufactured consent, and that's something I simply don't think is good. And I don't think it solves problems. The way to solve problems is to talk about problems. Thank you. Until she fired me. Continue. <laughs> oh. Just keep the record straight. Continue. Uh, actually, I remember that you resigned, but if you say I guess I'm lying us. then, right? Yeah. Sorry. Continue, Sophie. Continue. I apologize. Continue. Continue. Okay. Um. So I. <laughs> Tough, right? Sorry. Please stop. No, I think it's actually rude, but that's okay. It's, you can say what you want. Um, so, uh, how to work with colleagues. I have done legislation with every single council member, and uh, there are council members who disagree with me quite vehemently on policy, who are supporting me as mayor. And the reason why is that they know that I will be fair and equitable in working with them. I actually admire the way Mayor Adegine has tried to run our council. He took a very fractured council where people actually came to blows at times um, and who and on the dais and he really really tried to make a respectful respectful council experience very very patient and very open to hearing from the community and i want to continue to govern in that way i actually think as mayor if you have not listened to and taken into consideration every the opinions and perspectives of everyone
one that the voters sent to the city council, then you're not doing your job. As a council member, you can take those protest points, but as a mayor, it's a different job. Thank you. So, okay, so I've already talked about this a bit, but my work with Legal Women Voters was about bringing people together uh, across differences so that we're able to have conversations. So often, I was working with folks who completely disagreed about things, came from very different backgrounds. I think this is really important because we need to hear from everyone. A democracy is supposed to represent all of its people. And it means not only working together with people who disagree, but also being intentional about how we're reaching out to the community and speaking to the people whose voices we're not hearing currently. I, I really appreciate that question because I, I'm also someone who thinks it's really important that we have a mayor who has a temperament that enables people to be very critical um, and not respond in a way that is, um, that is aggressive. I just want to say that the mayor stopped meeting with all of us in the last year. Perhaps he met with council member Han, but he stopped having meetings with any council member. So I think he went too far the other way, and that's one of the reasons we have the issues we do today. He was very good about everything. Thank you. We have 15 seconds. So anyone wants to make any more comments? Oh, I'll just say that yes. During the pandemic, a lot of things changed, and the mayor did not meet with me weekly either. And I think that would have been good if you continue doing that. But I certainly, my, my goal is to be very accessible and work collaboratively with all council members. I want them to be successful in things that we share an interest in and on things where we don't share the same views. I will respectfully run meetings and make sure that their opinions are heard. All right, I think we have one more question. Oh. Okay. Any other options? Yeah. Okay. Good evening. So I appreciate you guys for being here, but let's be honest, students aren't voting for you. Students are overwhelmingly registered at home, not at Berkeley. How would you hold yourself accountable to student interest when they aren't voting for you? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. I, I have said, said this at multiple forums that we've had at UC Berkeley. First and foremost, I want to say, I think this is our fourth forum at UC Berkeley already, which is awesome because it really shows that we are all committed to making sure that we're hearing student voices. Something that I want to say in particular, though, is that I have worked uh, to bring up the idea that we actually have students pre-register to vote at orientation and that they get a chance to meet their city council members and representatives at orientation at the very beginning of when their students here because we represent the entire city of berkeley and that includes students whether or not you vote here and obviously the impact of the things that happen here um, you know impact you all and so we want to make sure that your voices are being heard as i mentioned earlier i've been attending the four by six meetings and this is another way that I think that we can make sure that student voices are heard. I also want to encourage students to get involved in the city. I have a fellowship program with 10 fellows. Seven of, seven of them are UC Berkeley students. This is another way I've been hearing feedback. They're all sitting throughout the audience. So thanks for being here, y'all. Well, thank you very much. Um, I just want to be very clear. Um, when you're elected, you represent the people who supported you, the people who didn't vote at all, and the people who voted for someone else and don't like you. You represent all those people. And so the fact that people may or may not vote at Berkeley makes no difference to me in terms of my level of concern for their well-being and for the issues that are important to them. So working with students, um, I, don't have a, I don't represent a district that um, borders on, on the university, um, but I have, uh, regularly appointed students to commissions. I've had many students as interns in my office. Um, one of my commissioners um, actually went on to uh, advocate for UC Berkeley to provide medical abortions on campus. She was successful doing that with my support. She, she then went to the state legislature and we were able to get it so that all UC and CSUs must provide medical abortions through their health services. This is a huge victory, and this is literally a student who came to me with this interest, who I appointed to a commission, and then worked with to help her have that kind of success. So as mayor, I will continue to do that kind of work, but also have regular meetings on campus with different, different student groups, as well as forums that um, all students may be in, invited to, 
Um, I worked on legislation with students, and I'm looking forward to continuing that. Thank you. Well, I did represent a district that boarded the campus. 60% of my district are tenants. Working with Cal students, I passed a better Berkeley bag ban to make sure that we had compost bags in our grocery stores. I co-authored the Southside plan to get you housing in the Southside of campus. I co-sponsored three e-bikes for low-income students. Working with BCC, I worked to put people on the Climate Commission that were youth that the school uh, district would appoint so that we have your voices because the climate is your crisis as well as ours. And with the high school, people that don't even vote yet, I worked with them on a healthy checkout ordinance. I am really happy to be endorsed by Cecilia Lunapara, who's your council member for this district, a super majority of the elected rent board, Telegraph for the People, Cal Berkeley Democrats, and East Bay Animal Rights PAC, because I represent young people every single day. Thank you very much for your time tonight. Okay,